Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altars of our life. You know, when we say we go deeper with God, deep cries out to deep, and we're going into the deep waters, it's not always comfortable. It's not always comfortable, but it is for our benefit. It is for our best. And so I don't know, like I said, how you have experienced the first quarter of 2022, but honestly to us, it's been quite intense. Hmm? And you sometimes feel that you are right there in the fire and you actually feel the heat of the fire and you actually feel the depth of the water. And I had a, a, a phone call this week from someone that used to be in a congregation. They are now abroad and she phoned me and she said, pray for me. I feel so overwhelmed. I'm at a place where I feel I need prayer. And thank goodness when we're in those places, we can pray for each other, right? Because the word of the Lord says that we might sometimes feel that we are going to be overwhelmed. But Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned or scorched, nor will the flame kindle upon you. Amen. The Lord is in the fire too. The Lord is in the deep waters. And like that sermon of the cracked pot sometimes, you know, we feel troubled and oppressed and we feel sometimes um, perplexed and sort of in a corner as if we can't find a way out and or we feel pursued hard driven. I don't know how many of you felt hard driven. I felt hard driven this first quarter yet uh, and pursued. And sometimes we feel struck down. Who of you felt struck down, right? Yeah. That uh, you feel a bit overwhelmed by all of it that's happening. But this is what the word says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8. It says, you will not be cramped or crushed. It says, you will not be driven to despair. Amen. It says, we will not be deserted to stand alone. We're not alone. We're not alone. It says, you may be struck down to the ground, but never struck out and destroyed. You know why the scripture says it? It talks further. I'm not going to go there now to sermon on its own. It says, because when we die with Christ... We will rise with Christ. Amen. Amen. Our God is a God that wants to recover. Last week's sermon was about recovery. It blessed me so. Like I said, I wept when I listened to that sermon. I could feel the anointing through the recording. It was amazing for me to experience. Also because I'm in that place where we need recovery, right? But God has been, when, he, when Christ was prophesied, in Isaiah, when he was prophesied, this is what was said over the Messiah that would come. He is a God that wants to recover, right? It says in Isaiah 11 verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, that is Christ, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and reverential fear and obedience fear of the Lord. And he shall make him quick of understanding, Remember, when we're in Christ, all of these anointings come on us as well, quick of understanding. And then it says in verse 10, listen, and it shall be in that day that the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal for the people. The root of Jesse, Christ, will stand as a signal to the people. Of him shall the nations inquire and seek knowledge, and his dwelling shall be glory. His dwelling shall be glory. When we're in him, there's glory. His rest, glorious. When we're in him, there's rest. Verse 11, and in that day, the Lord shall again lift up his hands a second time to recover. And in that day, saints, in this day, the Lord shall again lift up his hand a second time to recover, acquire, and deliver the remnant, his people. Amen? Amen. It is God's heart to recover. And like we know from last week's sermon, recover 
is to return to a normal state of health, of well-being, of emotional and physical and mental strength. To recover to mental strength, right? The action or the process of gaining or regaining possession and control of something that was lost or stolen. Let us just understand. Let's just settle this in our heart. God is good. Devil is bad. Okay? We are living in a fallen and a broken world. We might be impacted by other people's sins, even sins of our own. We have something like an enemy that is that is walking around. We've got a spirit that wants to kill, steal, and destroy, but, but God, but God, right? And he is, it is hard to restore to you and to me what has been stolen or what has been lost. Amen? Amen. And I don't know what it is that you feel in your heart you need recovery from. We come through a very intense time in this world. The last 18 months, two years has been excruciating in terms of pressure. And some of us have lost some of our health, some of, uh, some of our physical strength, some of us emotional strength, some of us mental, mental capacity and perseverance and um, capability that we need strengthening. We've had many, many um, phone calls about relationships that's taking strain over this time, especially marriages. There's an attack on marriages. So what has been stolen or what has been lost? For some of us, it is our finances. Businesses have gone through tough times, very tough times. For some of us, it's time. There's so much pressure. There's so much pressure. We're just coping. We're just uh, surviving. And so from us has been stolen time to rest, time to relax, time to be in that place of tranquility. For some, we have lost um, opportunities, opportunities or delayed opportunities. And so I just want to ask you before we go into the word of the day, what is it, if I have to ask you, what is the one thing this morning? That is the one thing that you would hold in front of God and say, Lord, please recover this. Recover this. I'm going to pray over it as you hold it in your heart. And then we're going to go into the sermon. Thank you, Lord, that you are a Lord that recover. You are a Lord that restore. You are a God that recompense, Lord. You make amends. You compensate for what was lost. Thank you, Lord, that you come and you make amends for what is lost or suffered. Thank you, Lord, that your word says that evil pursues the sinners, but the constantly upright and right standing, those which right in right standing with God, is recompensed with good. And this morning we come, Lord, and we ask you to recompense us with good. Not according to our works and what we've done because it's not deserved, Lord, but because of your faithfulness and your mercy and your loving kindness, which knows no end. And thank you this morning, Lord, that you come and strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble and tottering knees. Thank you, like your word is saying in Isaiah, Lord, we receive this word. Say to those who are fearful and hasty in heart, be strong, fear not. And therefore this morning we speak courage into our hearts, Lord, be strong, fear not. For, the God, for God will come with vengeance, with recompense of God, he will come and save you. And thank you this morning, Lord, that we know that you are a God of recompense. And that you come and you save us. And thank you, Lord, that you recover and therefore, Lord, this morning we come and thank you that you cover in your love this very thing that we are trusting you for to restore, to restore, to recover, and to recompense, Lord, what was stolen, what was delayed, what was for our harm. Thank you, Lord, that you turn it for our good. Thank you, Lord, that your word says that you know what we need before we even ask you. And this morning... We pray over this because you know what is best. 
And we don't know, Lord, how you're going to do it, but we know that you know best. And thank you, Lord, that we can't come to you in confidence of a, of a Lord, of a God that wants to recover. And we can come with boldness and in faith, and you've given us that measure of faith, Lord. And therefore, we trust in you, we lean in you, we rely on you, Lord, and we're already thanking you. We're already thanking you for mending us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Are you ready to receive the word? Yes. So let's say, I have an ear to hear. I have an eye to see. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Your word is welcome in my heart. Yes, we're going to pick it up from where Pastor Alma uh, ministered the word. She ministered the whole chapter of Luke last week. So let's go to Luke 15. Um, Luke 15, which is a whole chapter about recovery. Deeper waters, deeper waters this morning. Not always comfortable. So this Luke 5, 15, about the chapter about recovery was about the man which went after the one sheep that is lost. He left the 99 and he went and fetched the, the sheep and he put the sheep on his shoulders and he rejoiced. Now I want us to read verse 7. Verse 7, Luke 15, 7. Thus I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one, especially one wicked person who repents. Say repent. Change his mind, abhorring his errors and misdeeds, and determines to enter upon a better cause of life. A better cause of life than over the 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. And then we know this chapter went on, and there was a woman. She had 10 days of wages, but then she lost a coin, and she started earnestly looking for that coin. And when she found that coin, she rejoiced. She rejoiced in finding the coin. And then verse 10, let's read. Even so, I tell you, there is joy among and in the presence of of the angels of God over one especially wicked person who repents, changes his mind for the better, heartily amending his ways and abhorrence of his past sins. And then we have the parable continuing of the prodigal son, right? And he spent his inheritance and then he was in the foreign land. And then in verse 17 it says, and then he came to himself. He came to repentance, right? Verse 18, and I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. And then it says in verse 20, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity and tenderness for him. And he ran and embraced him and he kissed him fervently. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son and I don't deserve to be recognized as a son of yours. So he said to the father, Father, forgive me, right? But the father said to his bond servants, bring quickly the best robe and put on him and give him a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet. And what I want you to hear through these scriptures that we have read is that there is a distinct link between recovery and repentance or forgiveness. And sometimes these things that we want the Lord to come and recover in our lives, that we want the Lord to restore in our lives, we need to search our hearts. We need to search our hearts and ask the Lord, is there something that is unforgiven? Is there something that is unsettled? Because we all want to be recovered and restored but we need to deal with this thing in our hearts. Now, it was the same for David, and it, um, Pastor Alma also mentioned this psalm. We're going to quickly go there and just reference it again. just want you to see it. Um, in Psalm 51, you can open your word there. I'm reading from the classic Amplified of those who are following electronically. It says in verse 4, you see, David didn't, didn't um, say that he sinned against Bathsheba or Uriah. No, he, he said in verse 4 of Psalm 51, again you, 
You only, God, I have sinned and done that which is evil in your sight. Right? Verse 1, let's go back. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to the multitude of your tender mercy and loving kindness, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly and repeatedly from my iniquity and my guilt and cleanse me and make me wholly pure from my sin. For I am conscious of my transgressions and I acknowledge them. I acknowledge them. This is where it starts. I acknowledge them. My sin is ever before me against you and you only I have sinned. What I've done is evil in my heart. Evil, which is evil in your sight, sorry. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right, preserving, and steadfast spirit within. Cast me not away from your presence, from your Holy Spirit. Verse 12, restore me to me the joy of your salvation. And if we turn the page and we go to verse 16, it says, for you delight not in sacrifice or else I would give it. You find no pleasure in burnt offering. My sacrifice that is acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. A contrite heart is a heart that is sorrowful. It says in the Amplified, broken down with sorrow for sin and humble and thoroughly penitent. And then it says, such, O God, you will not despise. So there is a key to sometimes our healing. There is a key to our restoration where we have got to come to that point of repentance and remorse because that God will not despise. And it is a place where we are just truthful in front of God, right? It's just a place where we acknowledge our shortcomings. Listen, <laughs> we try, but we're not perfect. It's just a place where we acknowledge that we don't know it all. It's a place where we just acknowledge that, yes, we've made mistakes. It's a place where we just acknowledge that sometimes, even though I've got good intentions, it doesn't all work, work out good always. It's that place where we are just real about the motives in our hearts, because it's all in front of God. We just become real about what the real motive is in our heart. It's that honest place that is a key to our restoration. And this morning, I want to say to you and to me that it is really God's heart to restore us. It's really his heart. We see it all through the Bible. Joseph, Jonah, we see it in Job and David. But there's definitely a link between recovery and repentance and forgiveness. God has given me and Vilti once on one of our be still such a wonderful um, word. It was from Joel. Ach, man. And I've, in the interest of time, I won't read it all, even though it is beautiful. It's Job, Joel. 2 verse 19 and 20, it says, God has done great things. The Lord destroy the invaders. He destroys the invaders. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. And then it says, verse 24, the threshing floors shall be full of grain and vats shall overflow with juice and grape and oil. Verse 25, and I will restore or replace for you the years that the locust has eaten. Backs it out in the word. It says the hopping locust, the stripping locust, the crawling locust. It doesn't matter who has stolen what or whosoever has taken what. Or it says I will restore and replace to you. Verse 26, and you shall eat in plenty. That means that there's more than enough. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. Amen. And then it says, and my people shall never be put to shame. Never. 
So God wants to restore to us. And even if you are under his corrective hand, because he disciplines and he corrects us because he loves us, or under his teachable hand, even if you think that you are in a place there that you can feel, if you repent, God will certainly reinstate you to that position of blessing. Reinstate to a position of blessing. We may feel we have wasted time. We may feel we have missed opportunities. We may feel even that we have squandered. We may feel that it's too late. We may sometimes feel we are now, we've fallen so low, not even God can get us. It's never too late with God. This is what the word says in Isaiah 59 verse 1. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. But we need to come to that place of honesty in front of the Lord. Contrite heart. A heart that is just plain. You know? And the son, the prodigal son, he came back. He wasted, he squandered all the inheritance. He was embarrassed. He was penniless. And um, he just wanted to be a servant in, in his father's house. But when he said, Father, forgive me, I have sinned against you. I, he couldn't even complete his sentence. And then there was the rope, and then was the ring, and then was the sandals. And this is God's heart. When we come to that place of honesty, he says, come, let me dress you. You are a son. You are a daughter. God, you can come with confidence knowing that God is a God of restoration. And uh, like Pastor Alma also mentioned, God is looking for the Josephs. We have had that sermon in the beginning of the year. I think it was the third sermon of Coat of Many Colors, how God is raising up Josephs, how he's putting us in, in, in charge of storehouses. And Joseph really is a very, very good example of restoration, recovery, right? Because Joseph, oh my goodness, from him was stolen his dignity. From him was stolen his possessions. He didn't have anything, didn't even have clothes on his body. We always say we went with the clothes on his body. He didn't even have clothes to wear. They had, he was stolen, from him was stolen time. Years in prison, years being a slave. Family was robbed from him. His belonging, his sense of belonging, family. Even his country, his homeland, went to a foreign place. What was known to him was robbed. His youth was stolen from him. Didn't have much of a youth. His freedom. He was a slave. So Joseph had all the right to be bitter. He had all the right to be resentful. He had all the right to stand in judgment. You know what is a very interesting observation for me because, you know, we've got something like we, we call the law of first mentionings. The first time a word is mentioned in the Bible. If you look up the word forgive, the first time you will read it is in Genesis 50. Joseph's story. And this is what it says. Jacob passed on. They buried him. And the, and the sons or the brothers were now very concerned because they thought, now that dad has passed away, probably Joseph is going to let us have it. And then they said, let us send a messenger. This is what it says in Genesis 50 verse 16. Send a messenger to Joseph saying, your father has commanded before he died saying. <laughs> they were really afraid, eh? Because they said, your father has commanded Joseph before he died. So shall you say to Joseph, forgive. Take up and away all resentment and all claim to requital concerning. I pray you now the trespass of your brothers and their sin. For they did evil to you. They did evil to you. You don't say it's okay. They did evil. Now I pray you forgive the trespass of the servants of your father's God. And so they went to him. You know what it says? The first thing? And Joseph wept. 
and Joseph wept. That compassion. Hmm? And then it says, Joseph said to them, fear not, verse 19, fear not, for I am in the place, am I in the place of God? Vengeance is not, is his, it's not mine. Verse 20, as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about that many people should be kept alive, and they are this day. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for and support you and your little ones. And he comforted them, imparting cheer, hope, strength, and spoke to their hearts kindly. Oh my goodness. Joseph, who had all the right to be bitter, to have all the right to be resentful, to have all the right to measure them, he said, I'm extending mercy to you. And instead of speaking to them justly, he said, vengeance is not mine. And he ministered to them. He comforted them. He said, I will provide. There will be more than enough. He imparted to them instead of judgment. He imparted to them cheer and hope and strength and spoke kindly to their hearts. That is a God thing. It's a God thing. It's not of human nature. And this is the difference between law and grace. Because law comes and he wants you to pay, wants you to be in prison, wants you to serve. But grace is unmerited. It's undeserved. It doesn't make it right. They meant it for evil. But mercy and grace is unmerited. And there is a power that is released and loosened when God gives us the grace to extend mercy. Now, the same happened with, the, with David in Samuel. I'm not going to read the whole thing just in the interest of time, but we read of it. In Samuel 1 verse 30, you know that the Amalekites came and they took everything. They took everything that they possessed, David and them possessed. They took the women, they took the children, they took the animals, they took, they burned the town. And it says in um, 1 Samuel 30 from, one, one, from verse 1 to 6, it says, And David and their men, they wept until they couldn't weep anymore because everything was stolen from them. And sometimes when we talk about the spirit that devours, the spirit that comes and steals, we talk about the Amalekite spirit. It's the spirit that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That spirit that comes and takes what is not his to take. And David and them wept. They bitterly grieved their, their sons and their daughters. But you know, we can weep about our losses. And it's okay. We will weep. We will mourn it. But God will not leave you there. Not leave you at a place of despair. Right? And then it says in verse 6, But David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Yo. And then God, he inquired from the Lord and he asked God whether he should pursue, whether he should go and regain, possess back take back and God said pursue now that takes courage because you stand up from a place of weakness where you are so you are weak man don't have strength but the Lord of he strengthened himself in the Lord that means that the power of God came, came over him and it says in verse 17, And David smote them from twilight even to the evening the next day. No man escaped. Verse 18, David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that has been taken. David recovered all. Verse 20. Also, 
David captured all the flock and the herds which the enemy had. He recovered all. But then it says in verse 22, then the wicked and the base men, they weren't wicked. I mean, the word says they were wicked, but it was a wicked motive, right? The wicked and the base men who went said to David, because they did not go, because there were some that didn't go and fight the battle with them. They stayed with the baggage, he said. Because they did not go with us, we will not give them nothing of the spoil we recovered, except that every man may lead his wife and his children and depart. David said, you shall not do so, my brethren, with what the Lord has given us and preserved us. And has delivered into our hands the troops that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as, it, for as is the share of him who goes into the battle, so shall the share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And in that moment, David extended mercy. He extended grace. He said, no, God has recovered us. We've had more than enough. We're going to share in the goodness of the Lord. We're going to keep it for ourselves and think we deserve it. We're going to share it. And that is the heart of forgiveness. That is the heart of forgiveness, to share in the goodness of the Lord. Forgiveness is, we all want the recovery. We all want the restoration. But there is a key, and that is forgiveness and how to extend mercy. Because the... Forgiveness has got a real power to deliver. You must hear me, church. Forgiveness has the power to deliver. And you think, you, you know, when we talk about forgiveness, we think it's, I mean, we, we know these things, but sometimes we're too familiar. And we need to be serious about these things because forgiveness is not well, let me say this. Forgiveness is a command and a choice. It's not a feeling. It's not because they deserve it. It's, it's a choice because the Lord says so, because he knows what is better for us. He doesn't want us to stay in bondage. He doesn't want us to be there, to remain there. This is what the Lord's prayer says. It says, Matthew 6, verse 9 to 15 is the Lord's prayer. It says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven, remitted, let go of the debts, have given up resentment. Let's say, give up resentment. We've got to give up resentment, saints. It says, and deliver us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Verse 14. For if you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sin. Because some of it is reckless and some of it is willful. But when we forgive them, their reckless and willful sin, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sin, leave, leaving them, letting them go, giving up resentment, neither will the Father forgive you your trespasses. This has not got anything to do with salvation. When you give your heart to the Lord, eternity is yours, but you will be kept in bondage of that situation. You will not be loosened. You will not be restored in that area of your life if you hold on to unforgiveness. Forgiveness is freedom. Forgiveness is freedom and unforgiveness is bondage. We read about that in Matthew 18, you know, it was the parable. And it's interesting because we sometimes think... Um, Jesus was talking in Matthew 18. He was talking about the kingdom. Not talking about Old Testament or the law or anything. He was talking about kingdom. You can look at it quickly. Uh, Matthew 18 was a parable with Jesus talking. He said, Jesus answered him, I tell you, don't forgive one seven times, but 70 times, right? And then he said in verse 23, it says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like. 
He's talking about the kingdom. It says, a man, right? A man that owed money. This guy, he owed the, the Lord or the king or the master. He owed him, 10, was it 10,000? Yeah, 10,000 talents. They say in the Amplified, it's about $10 million, huh? which he owned. And then... Um, the master said to him, you must, you must uh, sell your wife and your children and anything that you possess that you may pay. And then that attendant fell on his knees and he begged him and he said, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. And then it says, and the master's heart was moved with compassion and he released, loosed him. Let's say loose. Loose. See, something happens when we forgive. We are released and we are loosed. Forgave him and he canceled the debt. But then that same guy went out and there was someone that owned him, the word says $20, about $20. And he said that guy must be thrown into prison until he can pay everything. He was unwilling to to, um, extend that mercy and that grace unto him as well. And then the master heard of it and then we, we see in verse 23, 32, he says, the master called him and said, you contemptible and wicked attendant, I forgave and canceled all the great debt of you because you begged me to. And should you have not had pity and mercy on the fellow attendant as I had pity and mercy on you? And then the master turned over him over to the torturers, the jailers, until he paid everything. So he bound him. He bound him. And unforgiveness is bounding, and forgiveness is loosening. And tormenting, the tormenting spirits just mean you go over and over and over the same cycle. Over and over. Cycles are not broken. And if you find in your life that you are somewhere in business or in your personal life or relationships that follows a pattern over and over and over, there might be remorse. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That doesn't have the power of forgiveness. We must not say to each other, I mean, it starts with, I'm sorry. We must say, forgive me. How many of us, when we have arguments, we say, forgive me? We must learn this language, saints. We must get this language, I forgive you. You've got the power to set free. It's in your mouth. Lord, say, whoever you forgive shall be forgiven. Don't say only I'm sorry, because sorry keeps you in that cycle, but forgiveness takes you out of that cycle. It's got the power to deliver. You know what? We We must get to that place where we let go of resentment, we let go of betrayal, of bitterness, of self-pity. Forgiveness, like I said, is not for the other people. It's for yourself to free yourself from the effect of that. Otherwise, you keep yourself in bondage to that impact. An offense, we must, set, we must forgive people for the offense that you've taken in your heart. Offense uh, in the Greek is skandalon, which means trap or bait. Offense is like the enemy standing there with bait and seeing if you're going to take it. But you don't have to take it. Offense is not given, it's taken. We must be aware of that. So forgiveness is an acquittal from debt. Anyone who hurts you, anyone who offends you, it is a matter of choice. It's not a matter of feeling. It is unmerited. It is undeserved. Especially there is power when it is undeserved. That is what grace is, unmerited favor. You know what forgiveness means in the Strongs? It means to pardon, to spare. This is going to bless you. It means to pardon, to spare, to stir up, to take away. To take away, to take up, to lay aside, to leave. To leave it alone, to let it be gone. To lift, to accept, to advance, to arise, to be able to bear, to be able to bear up, to carry, to carry away, to ease. To exact, to exalt, to further, to go on, to help, to hold, to honor, to regard, to respect, to rescue, to deliver, to freely give, to freely grant, to extend mercy. The word says, 
if you only know mercy and grace, if you only know the power of mercy and grace. One last scripture is Mark 11. Mark 11. Verse 24 to 26. For this reason I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you. You will get it. Now before the sermon starts, we said, Lord, please restore this thing in my life. This thing. The word says pray, believe, trust, and it's that you will get it, and it will be granted to you. But then it says in verse 25, and, and, whatever you, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, and let it drop, leave it, let it go, in order that the Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your failings, your shortcomings, let them drop. So when we are prayerful, and we've been prayerful on the threshing floor this year, we walk in faith, we believe, and then there's a third thing, forgive. We want the Lord to recover and restore, put us back into that position. We need to learn to forgive. Forgiveness is not, what is forgiveness not? It's not to deny that you got hurt. It's in fact to understand the extent of your loss. It's not to say, oh, it's okay. Just put it under the carpet. It's to mourn your losses. It's to understand the depth of the betrayal. It's not to deny, but it's just to deal with it. Is to deal with it. I'm going to ask, Will, did you just quickly put up the board for me? I just want to, in closing, give you a practical tool in terms of forgiveness. Uh, I hope you can see it. I'm going to also read it. If it's not good for the recording, I'm going to just read it as well. But like we said, forgiveness is a key to recovery and to healing. And if we ask for forgiveness, if we ask the Lord for forgiveness like David has, or even if we say, for instance, I use the example. No, let me rather just say this first. If we ask for forgiveness, it is to clear the air between you and God, is to clear the air between you and someone else, is to clear, clear the air you and yourself, clear the air. And it starts with, the A stands for acknowledgement, to acknowledge. This is what David says, I acknowledge my sin before you. Then the I of the A stands for impact. Okay, what is the extent of my loss? And then the R, I'm going to talk about the R just now. We think in human terms, we always think it is to say, I'm sorry, remorse. But in biblical terms, it's much more than I'm sorry. Much more. It's much more rich than that. So if I use the example, for instance, if you have not been there for your wife, your wife went through a difficult time, your husband went through a difficult time, you didn't support them, you, didn't, you were not there, or your child, let's use a more extreme example, your child really got hurt. And you may feel... I can't forgive myself because I haven't been there for my child. I haven't been there in that moment where they needed me the most. I've slipped up. I was too busy. I was not present. I was, I, and you struggle with self-forgiveness. The first thing to say is, I acknowledge I have not been there for them. I have not been there. Just to acknowledge it. What, call it what it is. Second thing is the impact. Well, the impact is that they got hurt. I feel that the, this relationship is now in shambles. I don't know how to pick it up. I might have lost my relationship. I might have lost trust. I might have lost their respect. So to understand exactly the impact of what was lost or what was stolen, and then when we understand the breadth and the depth of that impact to say, now, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry I wasn't there. I'm sorry that I didn't fend for you. I'm sorry that I didn't protect you. I'm sorry that, you know. And then repent. Repent means change of mind. We said it in the beginning. Change of mind, change of direction. A better way to say, I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to be in that place again. To walk away, different direction. And then there's restitution. Restitution is how can I make it up for you? How can I make it up for you? You must, in my example of your child, ask, what can I do to make it up? And then there's reconciliation. Reconciliation, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of reconciliation. He reconciles everything back to himself. And then there is redemption or recompense, and the Lord comes back. Now, sometimes we will not stay in a relationship which is hurtful. If there's been abuse, for instance, if there's been where we really got hurt, we may not make right, right? We may not make it up. We may not be able to make it up, but God will. We may not always be able to be in relationship again after that because of safety and boundaries, but God reconciles everything back to himself. We may not be able to recompense, but God will. He's a God of recompense. Amen? Amen. And so this is what I want to say, is that we've got to practice this thing. We've got to practice this thing of forgiveness, forgiving ourselves, forgiving others, asking for forgiveness. And also, when you are asked to forgive, like Joseph, his brothers came to him and they said, forgive us. Firstly, it was a choice. David, uh, Joseph had to decide to choose he, to choose to forgive. It's a choice. Choose to forgive. The second thing is Joseph had to give up his right to be right. We said he had many, many reasons. But he had to give up that right to be right. Because they did, they did want it for his evil. But if Jesus hold on to his right, where would we be? So you've got to give up your right to be right. We've got to deal with the list of remembrance, meaning David had, oh, sorry, Joseph had many reasons to hold things against his brothers, but you had to forgive them all, not only part, but all. And then Joseph extended mercy to receive mercy. The last one, and actually probably the most powerful one, is to bless. Because the word says, we must pray for and love our enemies. We must pray for and love our enemies. Love those who persecute you. You know what that, that chapter ends? That is verse, I think, 45. Uh, where am I? Matthew 5. It's for, verse 44 that says, pray for and bless your enemies or those who persecute you. But you know what that verse 48 says? It says, You, therefore, must be perfect, growing in complete maturity and godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity, as your Father, Heavenly Father, is perfect. We say, Lord, I'm going to share in the sufferings and share in the rising. But when we say we are transforming in His image, you will be tested on forgiveness. You will be tested on forgiveness because... If we say we go on to perfection, it is part of who he is. He is a God that forgives, that recompenses, that recovers, that extends mercy, grace, undeservedly. And if we say more of you, less of myself, you're going to have to learn how to forgive. Not for the other person, for yourself. Because every time you forgive, 70 times 70, every time you forgive, you loosen yourself from the effect of that sin, from the effect of that impact, from the effect of that circumstance, and God has a, a, has a way in to come and recover and restore. It loosens you, and God can recover, can put you sandals, ring. So I want to encourage you this morning, and I'm going to just give you just two minutes 
to just sit with the Lord. And we're going to play, play you a song to just bring before the Lord. Search your heart. Is there someone, yourself, others, that you must bring in front of the Lord this morning? See healing, and Wilty will then pray for us for physical healing. But physical healing is related to forgiveness. That parable where, or that um, testimony where the four friends brought the paralyzed man to Jesus, and he saw their faith, the first thing that he said to that paralyzed man is he said, your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk. I'm sure his friends thought, my goodness, we didn't bring him for forgiveness. We, we, we bring him that he can walk. He said, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees said, who give him the authority to forgive sins? And then he said, what is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? So there is a physical link between, there is a link between forgiveness and physical healing. Because when we forgive, that resentment and bitterness is released from our bodies. And so we're just going to give you some time to just, um, oh yeah, just spend time with the Lord and reflect. Thank you, Lord, that we will be quick to forgive. Thank you, Lord, that you have loved us with a perfect love and you have forgiven us all our trespasses, Lord. You loved us when we were still sinners. And undeservedly, Lord, you have extended love and mercy and grace to us. Thank you this morning that we can bring these things that's in our heart to you. And it is open and it is plain in front of you and you know our hearts and you know us better than what we know ourselves. And Lord, we want to be loosened. We want to be loosened by the power of sin in our lives or the impact that other people's stress transgressions has affected us. We want to loosen ourselves from bitterness and resentfulness and of offense and we want to loosen ourselves, Lord, from yeah, our betrayal. We want to loosen ourselves, Lord, so that we can come into places of recovery. And thank you, therefore, morning, that it will go over, over our lips, Lord, that we choose to forgive. We choose to forgive, Lord. We choose to forgive ourselves. We choose to forgive others, not because we feel like it. And we choose to write off that list of remembrance one by one. And as it comes up, Lord, we will... It will go our lips 70 times 7 times, times 70, Lord, because we want to be loosened. We want to be loosened. And thank you, Lord, that that is how your kingdom come. That is how you taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And thank you, Lord, that we, we know that we cannot afford to hold on to unforgiveness. And that you teach us that you teach us all things and in this truth as well. And therefore this morning we choose to, we choose to, we choose to forgive. Thank you, Lord, that you heal us emotionally, that you heal us physically, 
that you give us power and strength. Thank you, Lord, that you welcome us. Thank you, Lord, that you blot out, that you blot out and you forgive us our sins and our trespasses and you give us the ability to extend that mercy. Because when we are transformed in your very image, we are transformed into mercy, we transformed into tender, loving kindness, which knows no end. And therefore we thank you, Lord, that that glory will be seen upon us. Thank you, Lord, that that glory will be seen upon us. Amen. Amen.